Hi, my name is Shad and I'm going to be your teacher and guide today for this course on software reverse engineering. So that's the technique of taking code that's already been compiled and reversing it into something that you can manipulate. So that means you might see the source code or at least you will be able to see the assembly language and then make any modifications or understanding of what the program is doing. So this course is taught in eight pieces. In part one, we'll talk about numbering systems. So if you have not seen binary numbers or hexadecimal before, this will give you a great start into how you can understand what a reversed uh, piece of software looks like. Then we'll do some experiences to get you used to the idea of software reverse engineering, the first attempts. And that's this video here right now. Then we'll have a, a session where we compare the different tools that are popularly available. And of course, we're looking for free tools, but there are commercial ones as well. And then we'll talk about the reading the stack feature. So this is understanding a program as it's running and doing some debugging while it's in action. Uh, binary patching is about taking a piece of software and modifying it, even if you don't have the source code. And so you can patch things to fix errors or to maybe bypass a certain feature like a login screen or a registration screen. Recognizing code patterns will give you a more in-depth advanced feature of how you can see maybe malware and it diagnose what it's doing. And then anti-debugging techniques is the ability to take a piece of software who is trying to hide from you. Uh, so this is a cybersecurity topic where we are looking at software that knows that you are reverse engineering it and you're trying to avoid that. And then finally, we'll do some fuzzing techniques. So this whole course here is about software reverse engineering. Now the guides that are going to take us through here are from Dakota State University. So Michael Hamm and Andrew Kramer are both the teachers. So let's get started with this section right now on software reverse engineering. All right, I think we can get started here again. So I got a few more things here to talk about just with compilers and some of the like optimization, the problems that we have while we can't just take disassembly and make original C code. Um, then Andrew will take over for a little bit and talk about some of the different tools that we're going to use and kind of go through some of the different options that we've got to like actually start getting into some of the stuff here. So when we left off, we were looking at a very, very basic function in Compiler Explorer. And on the left hand side there, we just wrote an empty function. It was void f. It doesn't do anything at all inside of it. And on the right hand side, we had the disassembly output. And we changed our compiler flag to show this as a 32-bit program. But it doesn't really matter so much right now for dealing with 32-bit or 64-bit. So as it stands right now, this function does 100% nothing. But it still does a little bit of setup in our stack memory. So we're going to get into this a little bit here later this afternoon of like what's really happening on the stack. But we have two pieces of code here. And you can see the top part in green. Is called our function prologue. So every function that we have, including our main function, all of our auxiliary functions that we create, are typically going to have a function prologue, and the bottom part here in the yellow, a function epilogue. So can someone tell me what the function prologue's job is for? There's a couple of very important things it does. Sets so up our stack memory. So a couple things that we're, we're kind of bringing up here. If I call a function, let's say from main. So maybe I have int main, and I call function f, and then my main function exits back out. Part of the prologue's job is to preserve where do we need to go next when we're done executing our code. So in the main function, when I call f, that's not the last thing that the program does. It also has to do a return 0. So part of what happens when we call function f within this function prologue is it preserves our return address of where we're going to actually go back to when this function's done. When we have the function prologue, if I have any sort of like variables in there as well, like int a, it's also going to allocate some space to hold all of those variables there as well. 
So you can he see here the sub ESP16, just creating space to hold the integer value. How about the function epilogue, which is now purple? What's the purpose of that to do? Yeah, it tears down all the memory that we allocated. So if we had a bunch of variables and things defined in that function f, and we're done with the function, there's no reason to leave that memory allocated. Right, so it's taking away a resource from other functions and programs that we have running. So part of the function epilogue is to give that memory back to the operating system and then go back to the return address, in our case, the next line of code that should be executed from main. Is this program doing anything still? We make a variable a in function f, we call that from main and then return zero. Right, it's still not doing anything, but our compiler is still generating all of the code to do those instructions. Is that an efficient use of our resources that we have? Like, if it's not doing anything, why are we allocating the memory, creating a variable, doing nothing with it, tearing it down, right? This program should really do nothing. And so some of the complications in our disassembly goes to what compiler optimizations are turned on. In GCC, if you add a dash capital O, and the number one after that. That changes up our code quite a bit. Like I did zero things to my source code whatsoever, but you can see that our assembly output has changed a little bit. So the O1 turns on one level of optimization. If you go look at the GCC man pages, which is not an interesting read, <laughs> you can find what all of these different optimization flags do. Right, it's like not something that's really important for us at this point. It's just knowing that if we're going to optimize code, our assembly output's going to look different. So what does optimizing code actually do for us? If you like look at what our disassembly looks like now, what's the purpose of optimizing code? Save space, really makes things faster, more efficient, save space. Like there's all sorts of different approaches we can take for optimizing code. But point is when we look at this, right, you would never know by looking at function f how the disassembly is that I actually had an integer a there. But again, our purpose is not to give me line by line source code back. Your purpose is to look at this and say, there's a function f that did nothing and have that type of understanding with it. So not only does changing the um, optimization of code matter, but also changing the compiler is gonna make a totally different output for us as well. So in compiler explorer, if you click on <coughs> add new and go to clone compiler, it's gonna bring open a side-by-side -side window. You can leave them side-by-side. -side. If you grab the tab, you can also convert it into like a tab layout, whatever you like to see. Um, I'll probably just leave it in tabs. But that second window that you have, I want you to change it from GCC into down in the bottom of the list, you should see MSVC. And you can just choose the latest version there. So MSVC is if we were going to compile this on Windows and do this with uh, Visual Studio, what would our program look like? Right, it's a different compiler. The functionality of the program is not gonna change at all, but the output is gonna look slightly different. And so this was kind of an unintentional example here, but we can see that some of those assembly instructions look slightly different in the eyes of that compiler. So in GCC, our function prologue of main was moving zero into EAX and then returning, just closing that program out. In the Visual Studio compiler version of that, instead of doing a move zero into the EAX register, it's doing an XOR of EAX by itself. So can someone explain to me how the XOR operation works in assembly? Like if I have, something like this, and I was gonna XOR these two numbers, how does XOR work? Zero, one, one, zero? Okay, so what was our rule that we used? If they're the same number, what is the answer gonna be? Yep, same number zero, different number one. 
So in our case, if we x our number by itself, like 1101 by 1101, if all of those numbers are 100% the same, we're going to get a list of zeros back. So what we're really doing here is putting the number 0 into that EAX register and then returning. So why use that instead of a move? Yeah, it's, it's a smaller one byte operation. So if we looked at the actual byte code of this program, it'd basically be a one byte instruction to accomplish the same thing. So it was just a different way of optimizing that code. But when we look at this, if we can just say, we know that zero is getting put into EAX, then the program closes, right? It's that functionality that we're looking for. Um, so just kind of a, a point of note to make is that the EAX register is gonna be almost always used for returning values back from a function. So understanding that's gonna help us figure out what data gets carried back from these different functions when we build a little bit more of a complex program there. Um, just, answer, uh, just a, a newbie question. Yep. So EAX, you said, is the primary return register. Yep. How many registers are we talking about and what's the naming scheme? I got a slide here. Okay, so here's kind of your basic layout of registers. Um, I don't know how many general purpose registers exist in 32-bit assembly, but typically what we'll see is our registers are going to be named something like EAX if it's 32 bits, RAX if it's 64 bits, and we can see even the smaller registers here like AX would be 16, and if we break that 16 into two pieces of 8, we would have AH for the high 8 bits and AL for the low 8 bits. So we can go down to 8-bit registers. Most commonly in the C programs that we're going to look for, you'll just see things like EAX. So you don't really worry about the smaller ones too often. Um, they do come up, but in my examples, you won't see them very much. So a lot of your general purpose registers that can carry any sort of data will be things like EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX. And while EAX is typically reserved for returning information, it can be used in like addition or subtraction, stuff like that. Um, so how high does a register count go? I mean, how many letters in a, does it depend on the CPU or is it a, is it a, the version of assembly? I don't know because yeah. so so it's the CPU. CPU. Like, let's say, so it's, so for 32 bits, you have EAX, EBX, ECX, EDX, EDI, ESI, EBP, ESP, EIP, and then there's a variety of segment registers different instruction sets. So, eh, you have like six right. So, yeah. So that's actually an interesting point. So if we have like six or eight general purpose registers that we can use in 32-bit, there's even more of those registers that we can use in 64-bit. So you'll have things like um, RD8, RD9, and like there's just an additional naming convention that goes with that. And that's one of the huge advantages of having a 64-bit program is if we can carry more data in the processor and leave that data there without having to go back and forth to RAM, it's just going to be a faster execution. So every time we have to talk to RAM, it's a really costly in terms of performance. We don't perceive it as humans, but um, even like the old Intel 8088 processors are still way faster than a transaction that would go back and forth to RAM. So we want to leave as much stuff as we can in the processor. Disassembled code. So we're so the in line six of the right hand side, yep. you're getting a you're putting a zero into the EAX register, yep. and then you're you're returning zero. So I, I mean, what, what's the purpose of putting the zero in the EAX register if you're still gonna have that zero in line seven? Instead of returning the value in EAX. Oh, usually you won't see the zero, right? So the return instruction can actually take an argument, which is the number of items to remove from the stack that would have been arguments when the function was called. So that okay. zero is not the zero from line seven in C code. EAX is going to be the return value. The zero is how much of the stack to clean off the Ah, gotcha. So that so that zero means you're cleaning nothing. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Nothing. Yep. 
I would say it's actually weird for me to see a zero next to that. It's, it's always an answer I don't like to give, but when you're dealing with compilers and how they lay out memory or decide upon these instructions, I sometimes just say just how it is, but um, especially when you get into like memory layout in the stack, it'll add memory that you don't necessarily need to align things and you'll just see some weird stuff occasionally. So there is a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Sure, it's correct. In 64-bit, the first six arguments are passed in registers. Yes. So if you add a dash in 32, and if not, then I'll shut up. No. So we do have a bunch of like demo files that we're going to get into and actually start playing around with some of the tools. Um, Compile Explorer is handy if we just want to quickly see how small changes can impact the disassembly output of a tool. Um, but we also want to have that practical tool set, um, what people are going to use in industry as well and have some experience with that too. So I'll have Andrew actually kind of demo some of the different options that we have for doing some of this disassembly. And then we'll start pulling in some of our examples, looking at that stack memory, and then open up some CTF challenges and stuff here as well for you.